Open your Bibles this morning to the next to the last book of the Bible, the little letter of Jude. The little letter of Jude. It seldom gets the attention that it deserves some way or another. It gets overlooked in the shuffle, it seems, but uh, but it's such a very important message. And this morning, I want you to focus on the last two verses of this letter. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the throne of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever Amen. The theme of this letter has to do with apostasy, and that's why in verse 3, Jude says to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And in the light of what we're seeing today, the the apostasy in churches today, the false doctrine that is running rampant everywhere we look, we'd do well, I think, to spend more time studying this entire letter. But today I want you just to notice these last two verses. And the, down to that point, there is a depressing depiction of this wicked world. And uh, Jude being led by the Holy Spirit, thought it wise to end the letter on a high note. More about that later. God has a way of doing that. Amen. Ending on a high note. And that's what He's doing because He's been exhorting them to look outward to the world around them to see the situation that they're in. But now He's turning their attention upward. And there's a good lesson in that for us because... As we look at the world around us, it, it wears us down. It beats us down after a while. We get to thinking, you know, just gloom and despair everywhere we look. And it does us good to take the upward look. And to not just look around at the present, but to also to anticipate what God has in store. And in these two verses, we see five things here that we ought to always keep in mind regardless of what, what we're going through in life. And we make a big mistake if we keep God in the background of our thoughts. You know, we have all of that information about God and about Jesus all filed somewhere in the store cabinet of our mind and we're able to recall it and we're able to discuss it but during the normal course of the day, whenever, you know, whenever the pressure is great and uh, the, the, the life looks dark and gloomy, all of a sudden we tend to not be focused on, on the thing that we should, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ looking unto Him, the author and the finisher of our faith. And that's something we ought to be doing constantly. Now, don't misunderstand. Jude is no pie-in-the-sky preacher who just majored on making people feel good. And you see that in the first 23 verses because as you read through those, he doesn't pull any punches in dealing with the difficulties that the church faced in that day. He's not pretending that everything is well, but at the same time he's not all doom and gloom. He's a realist. And, and he, he tells it like it is, but he doesn't stop there. You know, I had a dear preacher friend many years ago that uh, got caught up in this doom and gloom atmosphere. And I, I can remember going and preaching revival meetings there. And I mean, from day one till the end, all I heard, it seemed like, was doom and gloom. Every, it was how bad everything's going. And it's real easy for any of us, especially those folks that are, that are my age, and we look back on America as the way that it used to be, and we look at the churches the way that they used to be, and we wonder what in the world has happened. And if we're not careful, we'll get stuck, lost in the 50s. You know, just wishing for the good old days again. 
And there's more to it than that. And that's why in this letter, Jude takes his readers from gloom to glory. He ends on this high note, giving them the blessed assurance, getting their focus back on God, letting them know that it's all going to end well. And in these two verses, there are five things we need to think about. Number one, and that is that God is the sole God, not S-O-U-L, but the S-O-L-E. So, He's the only God. Notice what it says, the only wise God. Now, there's some versions of the Bible, I hope you don't have one, that leaves out that word wise, and, and, you know, trying to keep the emphasis on uh, the fact that there's only one God, but... I, I believe the King James Version has it exactly like it all to be, to the only wise God. Not only is there only one God, He alone is wise in the truest sense. Now, I know there are those that would argue, you know, that, that there are other gods. Uh, and, and in fact, man has created a God in his own image according to Romans chapter number 1, when he knew God, he glorified him not as God, neither was thankful, but rather than that, his, his imagination was, was darkened and his thoughts only evil continually as it was back during the days of Noah. So rather than to worship the God, the Creator, he begins to worship the creature, and that's what man has done. The fact of the matter is, there is only one God. He is the sole God. There is none other. Now, somebody might be thinking, well, my preacher, that is so simple. I don't know why you would waste any time in dealing with that issue. Why, why would we have a serious discussion about there being only one God? Well, uh, you know, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But let me tell you, you're just as foolish to say there's more than one God. Let, let it sink in a minute. You're just as foolish. The fellow says, there is no God. For you to say there are many gods, you are just as wrong as he is. Now, I realize here this morning at Lakeway Baptist Church, I say, well, there's only one God. And you can say, amen. You can say, I agree. I know that's true. But. Do you really? And I say that because there are some folks that live as though there are other gods. By that I mean that they live as though there is something else that is as, just as important as God is. And that's why God keeps getting crowded out of their life. They give their devotion to, to something or to someone other than the true and the living God. And so you are living as though there is something of greater value than God is. You've just crowded Him out of your life. If you don't have any room for God, what difference does it make whether you believe in God or not? It makes no difference whatsoever. But to say, yes, indeed, I believe that there is one God and only one God, and all of our devotion ought to be given to Him. He is the only God. And so here we find this true and living God given praise. I, I've used the word doxology. Tim asked about the message this morning. The title of it, I said, well, I'm not sure yet. I'll, I'll let the fellows in the sound room know when I get up there. But I'm going to speak to you about the disciples' doxology. Now, a doxology is a word of praise. We don't use that word a whole lot in Baptist churches anymore. But it is simply a word of praise. And that's what we see here in the closing part of this letter. And so he tells us that God is the only wise God, that ought to thrill our heart to, to realize that our devotion, if our heart is right, has been given to the only wise God. I mean, there's no, no mistake about it. that We worship the one true, only God. But notice, not only that, verse 24, we see that He is a strong God because it says, Now unto Him that is able. 
Well, it just seems to me like that there's no end to all of the things that could be said about that little statement that that he is able. And so many times we lose sight of that. One of my favorite verses is Ephesians 3.20 where it says he's able to do exceeding abundant above all that we ask or think. Let that just sink in a minute. Above all that we could ever ask. You know, sometimes whenever we get in a bad situation and we reach, we reach that point of desperation in our prayer, you should I even ask God for that? Should I even expect God to do something like that? Well, unless the Holy Spirit urges you to do otherwise, why not? Because there's nothing impossible with our God. He's able to do exceeding, not just a little bit, but exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or all that we can even think or all that we can even imagine. Our God has all power in heaven and earth. And so when we face the challenges of life, whatever the problem is, we need to see our God as being the sovereign God. That means that God has the power to do as He pleases, and He does. And He does. The world's not whirling madly out of control sometimes like we think, you know. No, God... God has has His hand on absolutely everything that's going on. He's the sovereign God and He is the only one. So you could say that He is solitary in His sovereignty. He's the only God, the only sovereign God. We look through the Bible and we look down through the uh, throughout history and we see the great demonstrations of God's power. And most of you could stand to your feet and, and bear testimony as to what God has done in your life. You could talk about the changes that He made in your life, the comfort that He gave, the strength that He provided, the needs that He met, and you could go on and on bearing testimony of that. The point is that as God's people, we can, we can have assurance that God is able to meet whatever difficulty that we encounter. He is able. And of all of the places that we see the greatness of God's power, it is in the next thing that He tells us about God. Look at verse 25 now. He's not only the sole God and the strong God, but He's the saving God. Notice the words, our Savior. That word Savior means deliver. He's the one who delivers. He's the one who protects. He's the one that preserves. What a wonderful phrase that is. Our Savior. Notice Jude didn't say my Savior. He didn't say their Savior. He said our Savior. Boy, look, if you're looking for help in a time of need, I mean, this is it. If you're looking for a reason to rejoice, this is it. If you're looking for hope whenever you feel helpless, this is it right here. If you're looking for something to help someone else, this is it. Tell them about our Savior. This is, this is speaking about the sinner and the Savior. And as I look at that word our, I, I think about who all that includes. Whenever we think about Jesus and the price that He paid, and the Bible says He tasted death for every man. He paid the price that the whole world could be saved if they would be saved. It's only in their rejection of Him. He's our Savior. And I think about the fact that Jesus cared enough, that He loved enough, that He died for Hitler, that, that he died for the very worst among us. But the most shocking thing to me is the fact that he died for me. He is my Savior. He's our Savior. And when we think about how vile and sinful we are, it's just amazing grace. To think about, as Paul put it, that that he is he is both the just and the justifier. Because, after all, as sinful as we are, how could God possibly make it possible for somebody in our condition to ever enter into His heaven? How could God do that? He, he wouldn't be holy. He wouldn't be just if He just said, Look, I created you. You have fallen as a human race. 
You are a sinful people, but I love you so dearly, I'm going to grant you entrance into my heaven. God wouldn't be holy to allow something like that. God's better than that. There has to be a payment for sin made, and God provided that payment by taking upon Himself the form of the fashion of man and coming into this world in a body of flesh and being nailed to the cross and shedding His blood, and He paid the price in order to save us, to deliver us. Thank God for that. He is a saving God. He's a sufficient God. Now, I know you're thinking, well, you already covered that. Well, I said He was a strong God. He's a God of great strength. But it's one thing to have strength. It's another thing to be sufficient to be able to use it wisely. And we need to talk about this because there are so many unbelieving believers. I'm talking about those that that are doubting disciples or confused Christians and judging from the way some people live, you have, you would doubt God's sufficiency. I mean, the Bible says that He is able, and He is, He has the power, He is able, but He is sufficient. But whenever you look at them, you would think, well, God is dead, or God is disabled, or God is disengaged. He just doesn't care. He's not here. We need Him, but He's not here, or He's sick and He can't help. Sometimes we live that way, folks, and in our attitude when we're going through difficulties, when we're being put to the test, whenever we ought to be rejoicing even in our trials and what have you, we go around moping like God is dead. And it's because we're so caught up in the misery of the moment that we forget about the glory that awaits And Jude's wanting us to know that our God is sufficient. He's able, not only for the past, but also for the present. And also for the prospect, that is the future as we look ahead. Notice what he said. This is evidence that God is sufficient. He's able to do what? Number one, keep you from falling. Now, since He is our Savior, our past has been taken care of. Thank God for that. All of our sins are under the blood, washed away, amen, cast into the depth of the sea, separated as far as the east is from the west, hidden behind the back of God that He'll remember them no more. Look, the past is taken care of. He has delivered us. He has saved us. But that salvation is ongoing salvation is pictured in three ways. There's the past and the present. We have been saved from the penalty of sin. We're presently being saved from the power of sin. Thank God for that. That's the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in our heart, changing, transforming our lives, making us more like Christ. And that ought to be an ongoing process every single day of our life. That's the present aspect of our salvation. But then there is the future aspect. God's not only able to keep you from falling now. That word keep means to guard, to watch over, to protect. He can keep you up whenever it feels like your world is falling apart. But look at the future, the prospect. He says, and, not only to keep you from falling, but notice, and, to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. I keep saying over and over and over again, well, the best is yet to come. Here it is, right there. That day when He's going to present us faultless notice before the presence of His glory. I can't even wrap my mind around that. Faultless before the presence of His glory. Wow, boy, whenever I, whenever I just feel like the difficulties of life are dragging me down and draining my energy and just leaving me in a pit of depression or, or something, I, you know, I look at that and think about that He will present you faultless. Faultless before the presence of His glory. Without fault, without spot, without any blemish. 
sounds like Jesus. And amen, that's exactly what it's going to be because not only shall we be like Him, we'll be with Him before the presence of His glory. And the only thing I know to say about that is, wow. Faultless before the presence of His glory. We're, We're going to see Him. That's one thing. We're going to be with Him. That's another thing, a better thing, but... But we're going to be like Him. That's something that we could never do on our own, regardless of how we try to exhaust ourselves in religious stuff, regardless of how many times we read the Bible or knock on doors or pray or whatever it is we try to do. As long as we're in this world, we are never on our own able to become a hundred percent like Jesus. But one day we will. Amen. One day we will. And it's not something that we do. It's something that He will do. Like Him, with Him. Notice, with exceeding joy. Well, no wonder. How could there not be joy in the presence of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ? I don't, I don't have no idea what uh, you might be going through here today. I'm so glad to see uh, Lita and Danielle come in. And uh, Lita, for those of you that might not know, is Eric's uh, mother. Her, her husband, Richard, uh, went home to be with the Lord this last week. And uh, here she is this morning. And uh, I, I can just imagine what she must be going through, at least to some extent. I I can't really know for sure. I don't know what it's like to lose my spouse. God forbid. I, I, I don't. I don't know what I'd do. I might melt into a lump of clay or something. I don't know. And I don't know what you folks are going through this morning. But I know one thing: our God is able and sufficient, regardless of what you're going through. I can tell you this: that regardless of how difficult it is now. It's all going to end well. We've got, we've got to look at the big picture. Look, it's not about you. It's not about now. It's about God and it's about eternity. That's what it's all about. And when we lose sight of that big picture and get all wrapped up and burdened down with what's going on now, just this little spot in eternity, we let that we let that steal our joy from us, rob us of our happiness. The reason that Paul could say, "I rejoice in my tribulations; I'm content in whatever state I'm in." Now, Bev's got her version of that, and I think some of you have adopted it. I've learned to be discontent in whatever state I'm in. Sometimes, sometimes we get that attitude, don't we? But how is it that somebody going through the the very worst of trials can have the very best of attitudes? It's because they're looking at the big picture. I'm not smart enough to explain to you why God lets bad things happen to good people. I don't understand that. I don't understand why God, who loves you so dearly, would allow you, His own children, to suffer so much. I don't understand. I can't explain that. Don't ask me. I don't know. I don't know what the reason is. I just know there's a reason. And I know God doesn't make any mistakes. And we can take that to the bank. We can depend on that. That God has a plan, a perfect plan. And one of these days, when He presents us there without fault, before His presence in glory, as the old song says, we'll understand it better by and by. And that brings us down to one last thing about God, and that's the fact that He is the supreme God. By that, I mean that God holds the highest office. He has the highest authority, the greatest power, and He deserves the highest praise. Notice what Jude says here. Notice these words, glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. That's the point. 
He is the supreme God and deserving of, notice, glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now. Don't forget that. Because so many times we think, boy, when I get to heaven, I'm going to jump and shout. I'm going to skip down Hallelujah Avenue, kicking up gold dust under my feet. I'm going to throw a holy fit when I get there. I'm going to have the time of my life. Well, look, you can have the time of your life right now. Amen. The best is yet to come, but I'm telling you what, we can have joy unspeakable and full of glory right here in this world. The best is yet to come. I look at these words that, that Jude uses talking about how God is deserving of the highest praise. And then I look over in Revelation in chapter number 5. And here we see all of the saints of God gathered around the throne of God. That's the day that's coming. Amen? That's the day we're looking forward to. And John says in verse 11, I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. And the beast and the elders and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them. Heard I, uh, I say blessing and honor and glory and power be unto Him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever. And ever. Hey, Jude said that was going to happen and John's telling us it will. He's giving us a picture of after the fact in that day when we're all gathered home at long last. So many times we wonder, I've heard people say, well, boy, when I see Jesus, I'm going to run up to Him and give Him a hug. Or I see Jesus, I'm going to do this or that. I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I, I have probably just fall at his feet and not able to speak a word. But I know one time, uh, one thing, the time's going to come when all of a sudden the great choir of heaven's going to begin to sing over and over again, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. That's the theme of heaven. But notice that, again, what Jude says, he says, both now and ever. He's worthy now. If He's worthy now of our highest praise, our greatest devotion, now's the time for us to put that on display, as it were. Not for man, but to praise Him. How can we not give Him praise who has done so much for those of us who deserve not just so little, but deserve nothing at all? Heaven gave its very best for those who are totally undeserving. He suffered and bled and died for you. And if you're here today and you've never been saved, you need to take care of that this morning. And the only way you can take care of it is by putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're here and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you've received Christ as your Savior and that heaven is your home and you know that, don't ever forget He is worthy of your devotion. Remember Jesus said of His disciples, except we forsake all, we cannot be His disciple. Period. It takes total devotion on our part. Not only to serve Him, but to praise Him with everything that is within us. May He be glorified in everything we say and do here this morning. Let's stand together. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we can call You our Father and to know heaven is our home. Lord, we're so thankful for Your patience, Your long-suffering. God, we fail so many times in so many ways and to such a great extent it just makes me wonder how in the world that you could even be willing to allow me to live another day upon this earth. And I'm so thankful for that wonderful opportunity. 
for the privilege that we call life, that gift, the opportunity to be able to serve You. And may we make it our life's purpose to glorify You in everything that we do. Lord, I just pray here this morning that You'll encourage Your children, help those that are going through difficulty. And Lord, this morning that You'll save the soul that's nearest hell. May they not leave here today until they come to know Jesus as their own personal Savior and have that same hope of heaven in their heart. When we grow discouraged, Lord, help us to remember that the best is yet to come. We've got something to look forward to that's better than anything we've ever experienced. And I pray You'll help us to show this world through our attitude and our actions that our God's not dead. He's not sick. He's not displaced. He is present, willing, and able to help in time of need. For we beg it all in Jesus' name. Amen. As we lift our voice in song, you come. Page number 97.